But when her private life clashed with her public image, they turned on her. Deserted by her fans, publicly vilified, it seemed as if her career was over. However, she was never just a star. She was an actress, a great one, a courageous one. And that made all the difference. Her name was Ingrid Bergman. She never had time to waste. I remember going to the cinema with her and suddenly she would whisper in my ear, I don't like this movie, I'm leaving. I don't have time to waste. The important thing about her was that she never stopped working. She never just said, this is me and I can sell this and that's enough. I don't want to ride only limousines. I don't want to be only in hotel suites. I want to walk down the street and be the person who I really am. And this was the uh, most important thing to me about her as a, as, as a person, was that insistence on, on honesty and truth and uh, her feet always on the ground. There have been many changes around Stockholm's Nibrovikan. The ferries still run. The storefronts of the Strandwegen still remain. Here, Eustace Bergman had a photography shop. And in this same stronghold of conventional, middle-class respectability, he made his home. But there was a difference. For under the towered roof, he also kept his painting studio. And in this color-filled environment, his daughter, Ingrid, was born. Friedel, Ingrid's mother, had left her secure German background to marry Eustace, a struggling artist. Of their three children, only Ingrid survived. Ingrid became the center of her father's life and the subject of movies made on each of her birthdays. Through him, she learned to view the camera as a friend. This shot was to be Ingrid's closest link with her mother. By the following year, filming took place at Friedel's graveside. A bohemian at heart, Eustace raised his daughter to be a part of a formal, well-bred world. But every free moment, he encouraged all that was artistic and individual in Ingrid. I came to Ingrid, I was 18 age and Ingrid 9 and I, I think that her father wanted someone to be her older sister and I think we was sisters and she was very very happy. Ingrid lived often in imaginations she played uh, princess, she was a dog, she was a cat, and she was singing much. And her father, he learned her very much. He wanted her to be a great opera singer. But uh, she wanted to be an actress. Ingrid would never need to be taught about grief or the briefness of life. At 13, she lost the father who believed her the most talented, the most beautiful of children. Her aunt Ellen took Ingrid in, but she too died within months and in Ingrid's arms. When Ingrid was 15 years old, I took her with me to film studio. I had a little role in a film there, and I thought perhaps she could have a little job extra too. And after she said to me, I must be a film star, she couldn't believe that they paid her because she was so happy. Only two years later, Ingrid was to take the first major step towards her goal. 
Just yards from her childhood home was Stockholm's Royal Dramatic Theatre and its drama school. Here, such great players as Greta Garbo had studied. Ingrid applied for a scholarship to this distinguished institution and happily she was accepted. Actor and director Frank Sundström was a fellow student. She was a very different kind of person. Uh, this was at a time when uh, women in this country uh, were not supposed to uh, have ideas of their own, but not so Ingrid. Uh, she got, I think, disappointed in the school because she felt that uh, she didn't come forward early enough. She wanted to get into the, to the, to the work uh, as fast as she possibly could. And that is the reason why she uh, left the Royal Dramatic School to start to make films. At 18, Ingrid had her first speaking part in the Count of the Monk's Bridge. Oh, I mean, I mean, Other roles followed quickly, leading parts. The star strike adolescent was suddenly a movie actress. And for Ingrid, the joy of acting would never diminish. Praised for her gentle beauty, Ingrid began to yearn for greater challenge. She found it in a woman's face. <laughs> Viewers were taken aback at this Ingrid, coarse, disfigured. Meanwhile, an important event had occurred. She'd met a handsome dentist almost ten years older than herself, and they'd fallen in love. At 21, Ingrid was married to Peter Lindstrom. And with the birth of their daughter, Pia, Ingrid's happiness seemed complete. Vet ni vad ni påminner mig om? Nej. Jo, men viner vals. Intermezzo, the highly acclaimed film of an ill-fated love affair, resulted in world attention for Ingrid. Då vin en var en lycklig stad. Ja, ni är poet. Det blev man där nere. Den gången. It also brought to Stockholm the woman who would become her agent and lifelong friend, Kay Brown. Ingrid Bergman had come to our attention, and Mr. Salzenick sent me to talk to her and to get a contract with her, if possible. <laughs> it's a long time since I had that conversation, and as I recall it, we ended up with one picture and an option for another picture. In the meantime, I'd got to meet and know this lovely family, and I kind of worried as to whether or not this was a wise decision on her part. At any rate, that night we were walking in Old Town, and I had the courage to bring it up. I said, uh, are you sure this is the right thing that you want to do? You've got a wonderful husband and a lovely baby, and you have all the work that you want. And she said, yes, it was, because she wanted challenges in life and work in life. In May 1939, with a single suitcase, Ingrid arrived in Hollywood. After the well-ordered life of Sweden, it was all unbelievable.
They wanted her to uh, change her eyebrows. They wanted to change her teeth. They wanted to change her frisier. They wanted her to be something uh, more in the Hollywood style. But Ingrid answered, uh, I am Ingrid Bergman. That's my name. I'm going to keep it. These are my eyebrows. This is my mouth. These are my teeth. You have brought these teeth, these eyebrows, and my name over to your country. And uh, if you're not pleased, I'm perfectly willing to, to leave. After her first screen test, Selznick agreed that Ingrid's natural beauty should remain untouched. He was now convinced that radiant integrity should be Ingrid's permanent image. I would like to have known you then. Would you? Ingrid's first Hollywood film, a remake of Intermezzo with Leslie Howard, launched this image onto the American public. You see, ever since I first began to care about music, it, it seems strange. <laughs> what does? I had only one idea. For years I saved every penny I, I could to be able to hear you whenever you played. Did you? How nice of you to tell me that. You're not nice of me. Think of my being able to tell it to you. Mm -hmm. that was a, that's what I can't get over. Here I am talking to you as if you were an old friend. Well, I, I'm, a, I'm a friend anyway. <laughs> But only a little while ago I looked at you from such a distance, and now... You don't know how fantastic it seems to me to be here. And so fantastic was the response to Ingrid that it took even David Selznick by surprise. By now he had signed her to a seven-year contract, giving him total control over her professional life. Being under contract meant waiting for the right part. And waiting was something Ingrid never did well. She therefore accepted a leading role in a Broadway play, Lilium, despite her meager theatrical experience. Ingrid had magic. She had real magic. In fact, I used to tease her sometimes. She wasn't often nervous, but when she was, I used to say to her, darling, you can go on that stage and, you know, recite the telephone book backwards or forwards. They're, they love you. They just love you. It's what's within you. They loved her in Lilium. And they loved her in the film she made when Selznick lent her out to other studios. One of these was Rage in Heaven, in which she played opposite Robert Montgomery. Only when Ward went away, I lost you too. Now I'm all alone. Ward, you are not alone. We can still be happy together. I'll do anything you want. Listen. Listen, couldn't we go away together right now? Oh, let's forget everything that's happened. We can't stay in this house. We can't stay in this house torturing each other. Let's put an end to it. We will put an end to it. We two, together. And I'll have you all to myself. At last. So easy. Don't be frightened. You know I wouldn't hurt you. No. No, don't. Selznick, uh also brought me over to Hollywood, and uh, there I met Ingrid, of course. We were very good friends, and um, I remember that she, um, she was uh, very happy, very happy with her Peter and with her home and with her little child. She seemed to be very happy, but at the same time, I had a feeling that she wasn't uh, quite satisfied with her work in Hollywood. Uh, Ingrid always hated uh, um, what we call typecasting. She, she wanted to go beyond. She didn't want to be, be exactly a Hollywood um, cliché. With Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Ingrid won her struggle to break out of the cliché. Her co-star was Spencer Tracy. I forgot to mention my friend and I are physicians. Doctors? Oh, go on. 
<laughs> oh, I thought you were a couple of tops. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Have a leisure. <laughs> oh, dear me. <laughs> and here I thought. <laughs> Well, I'm glad to see you're not really hurt. Oh, but I am, Doctor. Really? Really? Maybe I better send you to the hospital, huh? No. Oh, look. Here. Feel. Feel. Right here? Oh. oh. Mm-hmm. Just as I thought. Cirrhosis pectoris. Uh, what's that mean? That means your eyes are twin pools of desire. Oh, Doctor. Oh, that's nice. Well, I guess there wasn't a man that came within breathing distance of, uh, uh, of Ingrid that didn't fall in love with her. Uh, I had met her once having a malted milk on uh, Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills, and she was sitting at this uh, soda fountain, and I fell head over heels in love with her without, without ever saying hello. She would come in very casually, sit down. Within 10 minutes, all of those men were absolutely hypnotized by her. And she did nothing for that. They knew instinctually from the age of 9 or 10 to the age of 80 that they were looking at woman. By now, all of America was in love with a young Swedish woman who refused to go Hollywood. What started as just another studio production emerged as a highlight of Ingrid's career. For generations to come, these images would recall a movie classic and one of the great screen love stories of our time. Casablanca with Humphrey Bogart. All right, I'll make it easier for you. Go ahead and shoot. You'll be doing me a favor. Richard, I tried to stay away. I thought I would never see you again. That you are out of my life. Maria, the terrorized Spanish girl in For Whom the Bell Tolls, gave Ingrid the challenge she sought. For her role opposite Gary Cooper, she received her first Academy Award nomination. The film for which Ingrid won an Academy Award, Gaslight. It also starred Charles Boyer. Featured was a young English actress, Angela Lansbury. A Gaslight was my first motion picture in Hollywood and I was extraordinarily lucky because I was signed to play a supporting role with the then new great Ingrid Bergman. Even then, even as young as I was, I was absolutely struck by her extraordinary ability to convey a tremulous, transparent vulnerability on screen. Come, Elizabeth, you must have answered a bell. Now, yeah, one was here, sir, while you were out. But Elizabeth, but you saw him. You opened the door for him yourself. Elizabeth, say it, Elizabeth, say it. No, ma'am. I didn't see anyone at all. He, he was here. I, I know it. I, I know it. But he was here. I know it. I know. You see how it is, Elizabeth. 
Yes, sir. I see just how it is. I couldn't have dreamed it. I couldn't. I couldn't have dreamed it. I couldn't have dreamed it. I couldn't have dreamed it. The stars really didn't bother to talk to supporting players a great deal in those days. You did your scenes with them, but she was interested and she thought the, the part of Nancy was terribly funny. And she had the most infectious, marvelous laugh and she, she enjoyed the scenes that we did together. She enjoyed the fact that here was I, a little 17-year-old upstart who had to put her down. And uh, she was a very lovely tall woman and I happened to be very tall too, although I was rather fat in those days. But they, they scooped me up on high lifts in my shoes so that I would tower over her. Uh, she was taller than uh, Charles Boyer. We both were, and we used to have a lot of laughs about that. <laughs> Charles was the most elegant, lovely, dear man, but he wasn't very tall. And uh, they always used to say that if you worked with him, you had to w walk in a ditch. To the visitor from Sweden who took these movies, it must have seemed she had it all. Ingrid's achievement in just a few years was a fantasy come true. She had captured the very heart of America and it seemed she could never ever lose it. You don't become a nun to run away from life, Beth. It's not because you've lost something. It's because you found something. You're still a little girl. You don't know yet. Oh, but I do. I just want to be like you. You don't know what the next four years will bring. You haven't been to high school yet. Those are years you'll always treasure. New companions, new interests, lots of fun, as well as study. Going to, to parties, to football games, your first prom, your first party dress, your first walls. You can't give up these things if you know nothing about them. Not until you've known all this and more. Can you say with complete understanding, I want to be a nun? Audiences that put Ingrid on a pedestal, never quite asking if that was where she wanted to be. Miss Bergman, I want to present you with this Look Magazine Award for being the best actress of this year. To Americans, the honors heaped on Ingrid Bergman could not have found a more deserving recipient. I hope I can continue to please them in the future. Say, well, that's wonderful, and I, I know that you've played with most of the leading men here in uh, Hollywood, and I like Gary Cooper and Gregory Peck and Bing Crosby. I wondered if you'd consider doing a, uh, just giving me a job sometime. Oh, yes, I would like to very much, Bob, but, uh, you see, I, I worked very hard to get where I am. Yeah, I see. <laughs> The United States was at war, and Hollywood did its part. Ingrid addressed bond rallies, toured bases and factories, and made a film for the Office of War Information, Swedes in America. And all the while, despite the public relations image of perfect happiness, her marriage was slowly coming apart. With Spellbound, David Selznick thought he had the ideal vehicle for his star. The director was Alfred Hitchcock. Playing opposite Ingrid, Gregory Peck. Quite remarkable to discover that one isn't what one thought one was. I mean, I have always been entirely aware of what was in my mind. And you're not, no. I'm quite ridiculous. How stupid of me to me like a distracted child. You're very lovely. Don't talk that way. You'll think I came in to hear that. I know why you came in. Why? Because something has happened to us. It doesn't happen like that. In a day. It happened. 
happens in a moment sometimes. I felt it this afternoon. It was like lightning striking. It strikes rarely. In Notorious, director Alfred Hitchcock lightly challenged the motion picture code of his day regarding the duration of a kiss. It's nice out here. Let's not go out for dinner. Ingrid's co-star, Cary Grant. We have to eat. We can eat here. I'll cook it. No, I don't like to cook. But I have a chicken in the icebox, and you're eating it. What about all the washing up afterwards? We need it with our fingers. Tell me, deeply, please. Yes. One for you, and one for me. Do you mind if I had dinner with you tonight? I'd be delighted. Ingrid's contract with David O. Selznick had expired. Now she would be free to select her own parts, and they would not be simply carbon copies of her earlier successes. Uh, when she became an independent producer, did uh, Arch of Triumph and Joan of Arc, neither of which was successful, I believe it was in her search for growth as an artist. She wanted to dig out something deeply personal about Joan of Arc. Men are governed by corruption. They like it. Men hate corruption, and God hates it. I don't know, but men take to it very naturally. Can that be true? Why, Kate, have you taken money from our enemy? That is not a question a king should answer or be asked. Then you have done it. You have betrayed us. All of us. Your country and even yourself. I shall tell the people of France what you've done. I hate war. I don't like battles. Every time I see French blood flowing, I can, I can feel the hair rise on my head. With all my soul, I pray for peace. Now, Hollywood in those days uh, glamorized everything, and uh, they glamorized their stars. Uh, she would come out of battle with uh, maybe one little smudge on her face, an immaculate armor, and uh, her hair uh, carefully groomed. And I think she herself didn't want that. Despite Ingrid's misgivings, for her role as Joan, she again received an Academy Award nomination. But events would condemn any new Ingrid Bergman film to box office failure for years to come. <laughs> Ingrid would always remember the first time she saw this Italian production. Its impact would soon overturn her life. Francesco! 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 Nino! Nino! The film, Rome, Open City. Its star, Anna Magnani. It was directed by a brilliant newcomer to the international film world, Roberto Rossellini. Open City was the first picture he shot and he had no script for it. He had ideas in his mind, very clear. He knew what he wanted. He didn't use professional actors except two or three. Most of the people were what he wanted to see in the picture and which he chose from people, ordinary people in the street. That was his way of working and that was his way of improvising, as they call it in the United States, but that was the way he made pictures. She spoke to me about Roberto Rossellini on a few occasions while we were shooting Joan of Arc, and uh, she felt that working uh, for him and with him would be an enormous step to get away from the uh, glamorization of characters that occurred in, in Hollywood in those days, and having seen Magnani and uh, Rome Open City and so on, she felt that this would give her a chance to uh, play a peasant, not a glamorized... Uh, queen of the celluloid. She was praised for her performance as a tormented woman in Under Capricorn with Joseph Cotton. Please be seated, gentlemen. I hope I'm not too late to take a glass of wine with you. My wife, gentlemen. Lady Henrietta Flusky. Sit 
sit down. But more than ever, Ingrid viewed her recent efforts as obvious products of a studio backlot. And of course, uh, Hollywood was extremely glamorous at that time, and there were very big productions going on, and perhaps she got a little bored. I mean, she was playing, she'd had a lot of lovely parts, but this man writing to her and saying, I want you to come and be in my film, was a great excitement to her. It was a new beginning, a new idea, and I think that's what made her feel that she would start again, which was very brave, very brave indeed, but then she was a very brave lady. Ingrid came here to Italy, to Rome. In 1949, I was 16 at that time, and uh, all Italy was in make a big feast when Ingrid arrived. She was overwhelmed from love, I think, because they were not only the family who really loved her. It was very easy to love Ingrid because she she was so natural. She was, she was so it's a fantastic human being. But easy to say, but she was like that. It's not an exaggeration. She was she had a communication which is. We didn't expect from a Swedish person, because uh, we know that they could have been very cool as a as character. And she was not. She, so really, love was in between us, was very easy. Ingrid was to star in a film called Stromboli. Production delays were only part of their problem. Rumors were spreading that Ingrid had fallen in love with Roberto Rossellini. How is it? In true Rossellini's style, there was no shooting script. And Mario Vitale, a local fisherman, was cast as Ingrid's husband. Terra. Como se dice terra in inglese? New terra. See? We plant again. Barley. Vine. I don't care about your barley, or your vine, or your new terror. I want to leave this island and go away, far away. Like all the others who lived here, and were born here, and went away, far away. What is this? Listen, this is my home. You're my wife. You stay here because I want to. Now reports of Ingrid's pregnancy overshadowed the film and made world headlines. Quick exploitation followed. Robertino Rossellini was born shortly before Ingrid was free to marry his father. Pia would grow up in the custody of Dr. Peter Lindstrom. On March the 14th, 1950, Senator Edwin Johnson delivered a blistering attack on Ingrid. He accused her of abandoning her husband and child and declared that Ingrid Bergman should never again be permitted to set foot on American soil. I believe that in America they had little statues, little heads of her as Joan of Arc, which she'd played, in some of the churches. And the, what happened, I think, is that when this broke, they took them out of the churches. And I can see her now standing, looking out of my window on the road, and she was crying. She was really very upset about it altogether. And it's funny because nowadays, of course, all this who doesn't mean anything, but they saw her as a Madonna, as a, somebody representing motherhood, and all these things that, uh, as actresses, we act, but you, she represented these things to the world, and they felt let down, I suppose. There was a lot going on behind the scenes in those days in Hollywood uh, that the reigning uh, arbiters of moral values, Hedda Hopper and Luella Parsons, knew about, and uh, with their favors, they kept their mouths shut. Uh, when Ingrid, in her tremendous honesty, 
uh, fell in love with Rossellini and declared she could no longer live with her husband because she was in love with another man. She was pilloried. Uh, the, uh, the Virgin Mary of films had betrayed uh, the image that they had built up about her, and she was uh, crucified for being truthful and honest as she always was. Although she was rejected by the United States, Ingrid set about building her new life. There was work, and there was family. I lived with Ingrid since she arrived in Rome. And so I follow her when Robertino was born. Then the twins, Ingrid and Isabella. And I know that she was very unhappy because Pia was not with her. And I was warning her because grown-up people, they don't know how much children can suffer about things. I visited Ingrid in Rome, and one day when I was with her, she received a letter from Pia. And I, I have never seen such happiness. She laughed and cried, and she was so happy. And when he, she, it was the first letter she had received, and I could understand that. I'm sorry if I woke you up. I, I only wanted to know how the children are. Ingrid would make six films with Rossellini, all box office failures. In Fear, she portrays a woman engaged in an illicit affair. Blackmailed, she resolves to commit suicide. Listen, tomorrow morning, when the children wake up, you must take them in your arms. You must tell them. You must tell them how much, how much I love them. So very, very much. No, no, Marta, nothing. Nothing is wrong. It's only very late. I don't know when I can come and see you. Marta. Can you hear me? Stay with them, always. As you, you always stayed with me. Goodbye. But there was something always very positive, even in the moments when she was really suffering. And I met her when she was suffering in, in, in Italy after all the, uh, the, power, the pressures that were being put on, on her by America and the press, uh, that, that she never lost that wonderful sense of hope. People used to say that he, uh, my uncle has ruined Ingrid's careers. And, uh, and they say even that uh, Ingrid has ruined his career. But what is career? Career is... Uh, doesn't, to me, doesn't mean anything. I don't know what it means. If you have, get to a top, but you never get to a top in life, I think. And I think that my uncle thought the same thing. And Ingrid, too. They were, they were just changing experience. Is it that you transform your ideas, your, you make a little revolution with yourself every time that you change, and you choose, choose something else. But career, you, well, you, you, you do less money, maybe. When, uh, this is career. The career can be that you just, it can happen that you, you gain less money, so you have less respect from the other people. I don't think that this is, is the way that my uncle and Ingrid were thinking about life. Oh, I knew him before I met you. Were you in love with him? No. In Journey to Italy, Rossellini sought to build up audience appeal by engaging another Hollywood star, George Sanders. I couldn't even visit him. For almost a year, I didn't see him. Then on the eve of our wedding, the night before I left for London, I was packing my bags when I heard the sound of pebbles on my window. And uh, the rain was so heavy that I couldn't see anyone outside. So I ran out into the garden, which I was. And there he stood. He was shivering with cold. He was so strange and romantic. Maybe he wanted to prove to me that in spite of the high fever, he had braved the rain to see me. Or maybe he wanted to die. 
How very poetic. Much more poetic than his verses. I remember Ingrid being very surprised by the fact that Roberto directed the way he did direct. George Sanders was very, very upset by the way of, by that way of shooting. And he told me per personally that he thought he was going mad because of the way it was shot. And he wanted to, he called his uh, psychiatrist in Hollywood five or six times and uh, wanted to quit the picture. And he said, how the hell can I get out of it? But naturally, he could not get out of it. When the financing of new films seemed impossible, Rossellini directed Ingrid in an oratorio, Joan of Arc at the Stake. They toured the opera houses of Europe, often as a family. Eventually, they reached Stockholm. The Swedish critics were not very kind to her. One critic even said, this Rossellini family who runs around the world to show themselves for money. And that was the maid, Ingrid. Furious. I remember there was a, a big uh, uh, concert at the concert house here where she appeared and she said, abroad, mm, I am considered a good actress but a bad person. Here I'm considered a good person but a bad actress. I think I'm n neither the one or the other. I. I believe that you Swedes have difficulties in ever seeing one of your compatriots becoming larger than the other. And you know what the audience did? They stood up and applauded, and I was one of them. Anyone who thinks that the Italian years were wasted years, perhaps that's not quite the word. I don't think they were. I think Ingrid learned an awful lot about living, a lot about Italians, a lot about love, a lot about hard work, a lot about failure, a lot about a lot of things she never knew before. And I think that she grew very much as a result of all the hardships that she went through during the Italian years. And I honestly do not think that she felt that they, they were wasted years or anything because they weren't successful years uh, in accordance with what Hollywood thought were successful. I think in retrospect, she grew up during that period. The strains of their lives were having an effect and now the lovers who had made world headlines were drifting apart. Ingrid took her career into her own hands when she decided to star in Jean Renoir's Paris Does Strange Things. But it would be completely overshadowed by the film that followed. They wanted to hear my opinion of what the situation was now with Miss Bergman. I was a little huffy about that, but nonetheless I went and I sat at this great big board table at 20th Century Fox and told them that I thought that Miss Bergman was very, very well suited to Anastasia and that they would be very lucky if they got her. And as far, far as her conduct was concerned, I did not take care to discuss it. I thought that she should gab the picture on the merits of the fact that she was a great actress and I got up and left. P.S. 20th Century Fox did okay the picture. You want to find the family to whom you belong, don't you? Ingrid's co-star was Yul Brynner. By yourself, you're lost. But with me, you'll find oh, yourself. You will... I, I'm tired. You know I'm right. The album. Take the chances. The only one you have. I'm too tired to ask. You don't have to do anything. I will do it all. Okay. here. Look. It's you on the deck of your father's yacht. It's Standard. Standard? You know the name? It's written on the lifeboat. Oh, yes. Now, here you are with your family. Your father, the Tsar, your mother, your sisters, your little brother. My family. And here, look. 1913, the anniversary of the House of Romanov. 300 years. There they are, on the balcony of the Winter Palace. Sergei Pauls Bunin, general of the Turkish regiment, former aide de camp, attached to the person of His Imperial Majesty Nicholas II, Tsar of all Russia. 
Your Lion. I am Her Imperial Highness, the Grand Duchess Anastasia Nikolaevna. <laughs> For her role as Anastasia, the woman restored to her rightful place, Ingrid would win her second Academy Award. It would mean a comeback. A comeback in more ways than one. Now, I know that this, it's a, she's a controversial figure. So it's entirely up to you. If you want her on our show, I wish you'd drop me a note and let me know to that effect. And if you don't, if you think it shouldn't be done, you also let me know that too. Because I say that it, it is your decision, and I'd like to get your verdict on it. I think, a lot of you will think that this woman has had seven and a half years, you know, she's had seven and a half years of time for penance. Others may not think so, but whatever you think. Whatever Ed Sullivan's audiences thought about Ingrid, one thing was certain. When she flew in to pick up the New York Film Critics Award, the reception was more than she had expected. The reporters were waiting, but there was also a group of loyal fans from the days when she played in Joan of Lorraine at New York's Albion Theatre. We would go every Saturday afternoon and every Wednesday matinee to see her come in and come out. And as the weeks progressed, she got to know us and recognize us, and she'd stop and talk to us giggle with us, show us pictures of a peer, postcards she might have gotten, a drawing, something like that. Ingrid was returning to the States, finally, after her exile. Well, now we're adults, more or less. The two or three of us could get together with the original group. And the other thing we thought would be some kind of impact was to make some placards, welcome her back, trying to get as big a group together to make as much noise as we could to distract maybe any negative approach the press might have as she appeared for the first time. A plane arrived back. 20 minutes later, Ingrid appeared at the door, and we started our screaming and jumping and carrying on until we were recognized. When the press saw this demonstration and the sincerity that was there, they definitely changed their approach, their reception of her. Ingrid, at the end, was received with the respect that she deserved. Miss Bergman, did you have any uh, criticism of the way the press in general handled the story of your life in the past year? Oh, sure, I had some criticism of it, because I think that the person has to have a private life, but I also know that if you choose being an actress, you have to take both sides of the coin. So, there it is. Looking back on it, uh, do you have any regrets about anything that you've done in the last few years, uh, Miss Bergman? No, I have no regrets at all. I regret the things I didn't do. <laughs> Not what I did. So <laughs> well, I tell us some of those? <laughs> no. no, I think my life has been wonderful because I have never, I have, um, well, I have, I have done what I, what I, what I felt like. I have never, I, I, I was given courage and I was given a sense of adventure. And that has carried me along. And then also, with a sense of humor and a, a little bit of common sense, it has been a very rich life. While Ingrid was appearing in a play in Paris, she and Pierre had their first reunion after six long years of separation. It was made a media event. More such media events followed when Ingrid, now living in France, was divorced from Rossellini and was sued for custody of their children. Agreement was finally reached. And Ingrid Bergman, with increasing visits from a grown peer, had all her children together at last. It struck me as very funny that here was Ingrid, my client, in Paris, Swedish, and here also was Lars Schmidt, my client for America, Swedish, and they didn't know one another. So I was not only Ingrid's agent, I played Cupid in this situation. I introduced them to each other. It took because not too long afterwards, she became Mrs. Lars Schmidt. Indiscreet starred Ingrid opposite an old friend, Cary Grant. In it, she again revealed her fine flair for romantic comedy. If you are willing, I'm willing. 
the last two days never happened. What do you mean? I mean, we'll go on as before. And not be married? That's right. Well, that's the most improper thing I ever heard. What? I can hardly believe my ears. But what, what are you so shocked about? I didn't think you were capable of it. But what is different? We are not married. We were before. But you didn't know I wasn't married. You knew. I knew you didn't know. What's the matter with you? How could you ask me to do such a thing? Hadn't you been following what I've been saying? Oh, I tell you, women are not the sensitive sex. That's one of the great delusions of literature. Men are the true romanticists. And... <laughs> what are you crying about? Oh, shut up. <laughs> Don't cry, Anna. I love you. Everything will be all right. You'll like being married. You will. You'll see. Time was passing, but Ingrid's beauty remained. In danger, you were any soldier. This way we have nothing to hide if we're caught. I can explain who we are and where we're going. You're given a chance to explain if the journey doesn't kill you. No. No, I think this journey was meant for me. Lena, I think this is why God wanted me to come to China. To get these children out. Ingrid became a legend, I believe, because she lived. We knew about her. Her face was a lived face. Her face was everything she had lost, everything she had laughed, everything she had experienced. And uh, it was a real face. It was the sum of who Ingrid was, in a way. Looking at her because she was so beautiful, so incredible, I said, Ingrid, what, what kind of exercises do you do? I mean, <laughs> like creams or... I mean, what have you, and she said, why does everybody ask me? I don't exercise. I'm not interested in exercise. I never exercised. I'm too lazy. She said, I like to swim. That's it. The visit presented Ingrid in a new kind of role. A woman intent on vengeance. However, changes had been made since the original play. Ingrid's co-star and the film's co-producer, Anthony Quinn. I had bought the property. The property was really mine. And uh, uh, my first choice, of course, to play the part was Ingrid. And at first, she was going to play it as the old lady. But somehow, she got scared of playing the old, the old lady, and she wanted to play it a little more glamorously. She gave up the wooden leg and so forth. It was important for me that you knew you were the first. We were both. Uh, both so young. I don't know whether you believe me or not. It was hard for me to pretend. I was too much in love with you. I think I screamed. I remember how surprised I was that those damn gypsies were still playing. And then you married Matilda Kovac. Her father owned the general store. Lucky for you, I did, Carla. You would have been stuck in Gullen, living a miserable life with me. <laughs> you said I went to Trieste, where I met Mr. Zaganathian, in a whorehouse. I think that uh, Ingrid seduced, I don't mean physically, she just seduced people. She was a great seductress. And uh, sometimes to a fault, because I think that sometimes she seduced people uh, so much that they would give in to her. I mean, for instance, uh, you're talking about uh, the, uh, I should not have given in to that seduction in, in, in the visit. I should have insisted on uh, the plays the thing that the uh, subject has written was the importance. But the thought of working with, with uh, Ingrid was so, fantastic that I I was seduced into doing what she wanted. Plays, films, television dramas, some produced by Lars Schmidt, Ingrid's passion for work was unceasing. But she had not performed before an American audience since she had left Hollywood for Rome and Rossellini 18 years earlier. Now, with some apprehension, she agreed to appear in more stately mansions. 
also in the play, Colleen Dewhurst. She was going to open a theater, the Amundsen, a new theater, in the very center of the place that she had been a queen. And where they had abruptly, and as usual without sense, had banished her. It was not treated as a play opening. It was treated as a news event. I think it was then I began to realize what Ingrid had to be going through. She and I were sitting together and they asked to interview Ingrid. Ingrid, I don't think, even realized she had a hold of my hand. And she just was squeezing it. Later they told me that on the news they just went down to the two hands holding on. That opening night, she knew, would be thronged with people that she had played with, the great leading men and leading women of the world, the great producers. Some opening night with us. Well, I hope you understood my card today, did you? No, thank you. I haven't had time to thank you for anything. No, but thank you, 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 well, you, you said something. Read. Yes, I'll read it again. I remember uh, something. Best, funny. best wishes for a faulty stocking. Yes, that's what these You know what that is? Long run. <laughs> When we did open opening night was incredible. There was such an applause when she entered. A welcome home. That welcome was made official when in April 1972, Senator Charles Percy paid a long overdue tribute to Ingrid Bergman, to the American public she will always hold a place in our hearts as one of the greatest performing artists of our time. She loved acting. I think that she tried many, many parts, some of which she probably shouldn't have played. We all do that. Nevertheless, she never stopped. And she once said to me, you know, we all think we're exhausted and that we have to go and have a long, long rest. She said, but I, I, I've spent probably two weeks in my island off the coast of Sweden. She said, I'm ready to go back to work again. And I said, yes, it's absolutely true, isn't it? Did you think that you're going to strand me in this ghastly hotel? Your nerves are dreadful and my bedroom is an icebox. You're making a very big mistake. You do not requisition my car. Is that understood? I'm sorry, but I must join my group. Well, take a taxi. Taxi? Well, take a horse then. We'll steal somebody else's car. Let's talk about more important things. Her career had spanned four decades. She had worked under a studio system. She had been an independent producer and for seven years had made films in Italy. Then she had returned. Well, you're certainly blossoming out. Through it all, her love for her craft had never diminished. The joy of acting. They would always remain devoted friends. But now, Ingrid's 17-year marriage to Lars Schmidt was over. Career demands had exacted their price. Miss Orphan, how long have you been interested in religion? From in 1973, Murder on the Orient Express was released. For her performance, Ingrid won her third Academy Award. And I, I saw Jesus in the sky uh, with uh, many little children. But all the children were brown. So it was a sign for me to look after little brown baby. Yeah. Were your parents religious? Nay. They had no respect for God. No. So it was not just a sign. It was also a furnishment. The picture's producer, Richard Goodwin. On the picture, all the way through it, uh, Ingrid was working in a play and uh, she was incredibly professional. I mean, she was never late, she always knew her lines. In fact, she was absolutely astonishing in that respect. And it's only just recently that I've learned that she was, in fact, ill. In fact, ill of the disease that she died of subsequently. It's something that I would never, never have known, and I don't believe anybody on the crew knew it, because as producer, I think I would have heard about it. 
I think it's astonishing that she was able to keep this to herself and never at any time to let it affect her performance. If possible, I think I admired the woman more than the actress. I admired this woman who had gone through so much in life and at this point when we started the film already was marked by her illness, by cancer, but nobody knew about it. It was never talked about. Ingrid came first before anybody else to the studio. She was the last to leave. And even when she had to do things like lying on the floor and put her arms back over her head, which I'm uh, told later is very hurtful after the operation she had had, she never said, I can't do that, I'm not well. Ingrid took her arms, put them behind her head, and did her part. You were unfaithful. Absolutely not. I was entirely truthful and above board with Papa. I was attracted to Martin at the time and lived with him for eight months. You don't, you don't think that affair was any bed of roses? Well, it was I who had to remain with Papa every night. It was I who had to console him. It was I who, despite everything, kept repeating that you really did love him and that you really were coming back. It was I who had to open up your letters and read them out loud. Your long, loving, amusing letters which you told us choice bits about your interesting travels. We'd both sit there like foolish idiots. And how many times we'd go through your letters. We thought there wasn't anyone more special than you. Eva, you hate me. <laughs> many people, I think, believe that Autumn Sonata, since it was a film about a career woman who had a child but uh, for a long time also traveled and and uh, attended her career was a film about Ingrid her life obviously it was not uh, Autumn Sonata was written by a man it was a man's view of how a career woman maybe has a lot of guilt for for leaving the child at intervals for for mistreating the child by the very fact of her leaving uh, I don't think Ingrid felt that. I know she didn't feel that this uh, script was her words. Uh, I think Ingrid took pride in what her work had been, and she took pride in, in the way she had been a mother, and I think she took pride in the way she had loved. I think Ingrid believed that uh, a person can have many roles, and you don't have to do all of them to perfection, to... Uh, to feel, to feel you're doing right. Uh, Ingrid had a wonderful way of never looking back at mistakes she had done, you know, shivering with her mouth and, and feeling bad about it. She would look uh, back and, and smile and laugh. Sometimes she would have anger, but the anger would never be malicious. The anger would just be, I could have taken that bastard. And she would, you know, laugh i think it's her laughter i remember the most you know the room would just fill up with the uh, with laughter in 1981 ingrid appeared in a television production a woman called golda well if i'm supposed to be the mother of israel earth mother or whatever kind of mother I have, I have the responsibility, the responsibility to be a good, good mother. mother. And, and what, what a, a good, good mother would say to you now, now is, is, it's late, late. Everybody's, everybody's tired, tired. Go, go home. home. <laughs> Mr. President, I say good night. Good night, dear lady. I hope we see each other again soon. I'm glad you came. I'm glad too. So, let me ask, what took you so long? For her performance, Ingrid received an Emmy posthumously. It was accepted by her daughter, Pia Lindstrom. I know that she would be very proud of this award tonight because of what it meant to her to film it. And I'm very grateful to be here to be able to thank each and every one of you. 
for this final tribute to my mother. She will live in my heart forever. Thank you. It has been said that a, a great actor never worries about where the key light is, that the light is inside of him. Very few actors have the light inside of him. I think uh, Ingrid Claude from inside. She carried her, her light inside. She treated success and failure as both imposters. And she knew, she somehow knew that she could, could exist on any level and that she could live on any level and that this radiance that came from inside would never go out and it never has gone out. Even that moment when she told me very simply that she was ill in Pia's apartment and I knew what she was saying and got up and went over to her, it was dealt again with a great simplicity and a great honesty of what she had done in her life, what she stood for before our time. She had loved the men that she wanted to love. She had had the children she wanted to have. She was grateful she had grandchildren and it did not dismay her that she had them. She had done, by then, the movie with Liv Ullman. She would go on then to do Gold in My Ear. She would end her life with the people she loved around her on her birthday with great affection and giving them the understanding that she would rise again tomorrow, but also with the understanding and the honesty that she was going to go and it was all right. <laughs> A week before she died, Ingrid returned to Stockholm. It was a time for saying goodbye to old friends. It was a time for remembering.